Hey everybody, it's your boy, Eduardo Jackson, CEO founder of Cinema Draft LLC and founder of BlacksandBitcoin.com, where everybody's welcome, but I stay black and loving Bitcoin. And we are back with CNBC's own segment producer for Squawk Box and my lady love, Melissa Lee, she don't know it yet. Columbia University School of Journalism graduate, graduate, congratulations taking time yeah. out of her busy East Coast brunching schedule. It's Courtney Brown. Hey, Courtney. Hey, thank you for having me back. It's a really crappy day in New York, so it's a good day to not be outside brunching. What? It's good crappy to be day inside. in New York? Oh, yeah, nice. it's really gloomy and like cold and ugh, awful. So. Sounds like a Vegas vacation is in your future. You know, we'll, we'll have you. We're that all, sounds always lovely. Are, it's Are you hundred... buying? What's that? Are you buying? It sounds like you're inviting me. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm up for this big competition, <laughs> and if it goes through, I don't know. Fingers crossed. I'm not gonna jinx it. All right. Anyways, yeah. But yes, next up when you're when you're in Vegas, I'm buying. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. So okay. so just real quick, what have you what have you been up to? What's going on in those CNB streets over there? So I graduated two weeks ago, so I'm finally not. Um, kind of staying up all hours of the day and the night. So I've, I've been able to kind of focus truly on work and the markets and all that stuff. So, so things are good. Things are, things are busy, but things are good. A lot of Trump, a lot of um, trade, a lot of that stuff, a lot of North Korea. Um, but, you know, we're finding some time to talk about Bitcoin, I think. Nice, nice. And, <laughs> and, so, and so what's Squawk Box's focus recently? Because like last time we spoke to you, I think you just come from Davos or something. And, and it was all about the, you know, I guess the, the G20, was it G20? G10, something like that. So, so what's, yeah, what's like really kind of turning the wheels over there in, in Fiat Street? Is that what you guys call us? <laughs> That's what I'm calling it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last time, or maybe the time before last that we spoke, I had just come back from Davos and, you know, it was CEO after CEO coming on our set. And of course, bank CEOs particularly, of course, we're throwing them questions about Bitcoin. Um, and I think we talked about kind of what the response was, a, a little meh on it still. I don't think too much has changed. Um, you, you know, this is a little bit older, but I haven't talked to you in a few weeks, but we did have Warren Buffett, um, Charlie Munger, and Bill Gates uh, on our set early in May, um, and Bitcoin came up. And I, I, I'm sure you heard it. Charlie Cheers. Munger. Well, well yeah. so, so Bill, I, a, a fellow Lakeside High School alumnus, um, he, <laughs> he's obviously a little more open to it than, than others, probably because he's not... I mean, he's old, but he's not an entirely an old per se. Like Warren Buffett is, t is yeah. totally an old. And look, and I, in this respect, I, I respect Warren as far as much as I mean, obviously with the Vampire Party's built, but also as far in in so much as far as him admitting that you know I don't really know this stuff. Okay, cool. But then he goes off on the screen on how it's like it's fake, it's crap, it's it's you know rat poison. It's like, dude, that was Charlie dude. Munger, rat poison, a turd. Uh, that, was, that was Charlie Munger who said rat that was Charlie Munger, okay, uh, right? Bad. Yeah, rat poison. Either way, <laughs> Buffett, no, Buffett did say worthless artificial gold. That's what he compared there you go. Bitcoin there you to. Go. Yeah, and and it's funny because like so, I'm still an, an active member and I think like a mod or something in the the BPNC, the Black People in Cryptocurrency Group, and about every like three weeks we get what 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 what, what, what is that. <laughs> I'm just waiting to be added to that because this is the second time you've brought it up to me. And um, I mean, I, I can. I don't like adding people without their permission, but I probably should. Have a great, <laughs> you know, background for your job. Uh, it anyways, sounds great. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Uh, every like every three weeks or so, we will get somebody coming in there shilling like a, a, a digital version of gold. Like, well, you know, I'm not even gonna say their name. I'm not gonna give. Them, air to breathe but this latest one was like yeah you know we're we're cryptocurrency is backed by gold and i just i just had it that day i'm like you know what you know i'm i've had enough of you and your you guys and your shiny rock all right which is useless <laughs> for nothing except for like fillings and like maybe electrical parts I was, I was done i was like if i wanted fake gold i'd go buy paper gold it's already out there i don't need you know some fake cryptocurrency backed by a rock nobody really uses so i was at an end rant and the guy was like <laughs> I think he's a little shell shocked, but um, I just kind of get tired of this. Like, I mean, that's analog. We are digital. We are, yeah. 
in anyways, I'm off my soapbox, but yes. Does this guy me. block you on Facebook? or? No, no, well, I mean, I wish he would because then he'd be right out of the group. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I, I okay. left his post up. I left his post up just as like, you know, a cautionary tale to others. But, you know, it's, it's – just to stop it, y'all. Stop it. If we, I mean, there are already, you know, fake paper – gold products out there if you want if you're into that type of life i'm not i'm into stuff that you can actually use that is that's low to no barriers to entry like cryptocurrency and that's why we're here on this beautiful sunday morning with courtney brown all right five things first thing up and you can speak to this to whatever level degree oh and also and actually before i forget i mean we've been staring at this or you've been staring at this actually um since we got on uh a quick shill moment. I will be on a panel at the Black Enterprise Entrepreneurs Summit in Charlotte, North Carolina. This, oh yeah, this Thursday. Yes, it is the title, Tales from the Crypt, What's So Scary About Cryptocurrency? As you know, nothing. <laughs> but we'll be hosted by the lovely and talented Samara Lynn of Black Enterprise. She'll be our moderator. And it should be a, a, a pretty good time. We'll have Q&A. We have uh, Brian Brackeen from Kairos, uh, a, a, I think a, a blockchain-friendly startup. And then Daryl Hubbard from Yet a Blockchain. It's in the title. So if y'all are in Charlotte, got a couple hundred bucks to spare, <laughs> come on by. Check us out. If you use my code SPK18, you get $75 off the price of admission. Expecting thousands of people to be there. Oh, and also, it's kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe not. Um... Also scheduled to be there is Cubes. Come on. Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban. Well, wow. Okay, that's not the, the page I wanted to see. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mark Cuban is one of the – yeah, Byron – first of all, can we can we just take a pause real quick for what Byron Allen's doing quietly in the game? Are you familiar? No. Tell me. Okay, so, yeah, well, hell, Byron Allen's barely my, my generation. But he, uh, he used to be like a comedian, um, not – you know – Pretty, be honest with you, fairly mediocre comedian, you know, it wasn't terribly funny, but he made like a cottage industry on late night TV doing all these just like press junket interviews. Like you'd see him with like this really huge big stars, Tom Cruise, whatever, you know, as part of like the press junkets for their films and they'd air like one, two in the morning, whatever. And I don't know what exactly uh, Byron, you know, did, but he just stacked his chips and eventually bought himself like a little, you know, or created either, he either created or bought himself a little movie studio and started, you know, releasing, you know, you know, small films, you know, medium films. I mean, sometimes kind of schlocky stuff. Like, I think his latest one was uh, Hurricane Heist, which I think <laughs> approximately five people saw. Uh, and <laughs> But he's quietly been just amassing a lot of assets in the background of entertainment. And right now he's, I mean, I, 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 this, uh, you know, I, I need to research this, but I think he might even own like a piece of the Weather Channel. I mean, he just got like... He, That's right. That's right. I, he did buy the Weather Channel. That's yeah. right. A few months ago. Yeah, That's right. He <clears> has <throat> been caking up and that friend of mine uh, actually um works with him or has worked with him on some some stuff and she's like yeah he's quietly major so he's going to be there as you can see these lovely you know names faces floating by all these other people are going to be there cubes is a speaker i think ti also is going to be there on hmm. something so it should be should be a good time for anyone who's in or around charlotte or you know make it make a weekend trip come come holla this all right shill moment over <laughs> Back to what's real on the street. So thanks to the message board grinders, <laughs> the, 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 the Reddit Adi, who are out here investigating anything nefarious in crypto, there was quite an interesting, um, shall we I think they're called Twitter Moments, collections of tweets about a proposed CNBC, your employer, fast money, Bitcoin cash pump and dump. This is kind of fascinating, and you don't have to speak to it yet, but this is kind of fascinating because, so Samson Mao, like I guess a, um, a, a Wall Street analyst and, oh, <laughs> Secretary Whale Panda for interviews. Anyways, uh, he's, he's pretty big on Twitter in the crypto streets. He, uh, he proposed that, that there is some, shall we say, uh, uh, internal pumping on CNBC when it comes to Bitcoin Cash, a highly controversial cryptocurrency of which, that most of us uh, crypto truthers are just not down with at all. First of all, let me ask you this, Courtney. What do you know about Bitcoin Cash? And what, and what do people generally like in you know fiat world think of Bitcoin Cash? Because I'm very intrigued by this. Yeah, I don't, I didn't realize there was such um, 
a beef between um, I don't even know what to call the community, like people who really believe in Bitcoin and people who believe in Bitcoin Cash. Right. Um, I, I know that Bitcoin Cash, they, they Bitcoin like trash, aim to we call it. <laughs> oh really oh gosh okay <laughs> bitcoin cash i know that they aim to like increase the size of the blocks which would allow for more transactions to be processed right mm -hmm. um i don't i don't understand why what the hatred is maybe you can give me a quick 30 second you know debrief on that absolutely so here's part mm -hmm. of the issue with uh with bitcoin cash so in the idea was fine it was actually one of the first forks of of uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And which, had, mm -hmm. which at the time we thought was like really controversial. And for those of you who aren't aware, a fork is basically like a, uh, a variation of the code that exists on its own, separate. So kind of like, um, yeah, which runs in parallel. And everyone who had, you know, amounts of Bitcoin before gets matched with equal amounts of Bitcoin cash. Now, I, mm -hmm. I sold mine a while ago when it was like two or 400 bucks per Bitcoin, or whatever, because I hadn't seen a future in it. I think it's over like $1,000, 1200 or something today, whatever. But basically, and you're right there, Bitcoin cash is there to create a, like a bigger block size, make faster instant transactions, things that, you know, arguably Bitcoin needs. But it's being largely promoted and shilled by some pretty unreputable people. Roger K. Ver, a.k.a. Bitcoin Jesus, self-aggrandized self Bitcoin Jesus. Very controversial <laughs> figure because he's a fucking criminal, number one. Number two, he is he, – all his stuff is very self-serving and not for the community at all. No one trusts him. He's always trying to manipulate stuff. It, he's very bad look. He's partnered up with Jihan Wu, who's head of, uh, is, it, is it Bitmain? No, one of the, one of the largest, oh, Ant Miner, I think. One of the largest uh, mining pools in Bitcoin. So he's got a lot to gain by, you know, pumping a fork that he controls some like 60% of. And then the trifecta, the, the, tri the trifecta of shadiness is your boy, Craig S. Wright, who calls himself Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he claims he's the original Satoshi. It's been... You know, it's been wildly disproven he's not Satoshi. Most people actually think Satoshi's probably dead or something. So it's just amazing this guy is out here claiming to be Satoshi. So you get those three characters together, shilling hard, you know, something that they have like a huge, you know, personal interest in, and no, you, can't, you can't trust it. And also, uh, from a technological standpoint, Lightning Network's already being rolled out, and it's going to make Bitcoin Cash um, I mean, if not obsolete, it'll it'll be you know less valuable to hold once the Lightning Network finishes rolling out. In my hmm. opinion. Hmm. So is the concern that just and this is just based on what I I was reading and what I've been reading in the last few months is the concern that Bitcoin Cash has the potential to give a certain group of people more power than than you know, smaller miners, let's say. Is that is that part of the concern too or not so much? That's that's part of the concern, but okay. also but it's it's largely the fact that these charlatans are promoting it and the, and then they and apparently the reach is far and wide because the, the allegation on the CNBC side is that <laughs> and, uh, so you see if we had to actually find the right tweet. But basically so so Brian Kelly was uh, uh, I guess he's had a somewhat uh, interesting history of, of pumping and dumping different coins in the past. And also one of the, I think it is one of the producers on CNBC Fast Money actually has uh, a spouse who is highly connected to Bitcoin Cash. And so and, and so Samson Mao just joined together all these tweets of evidence and, and speculation of people who were like, something's, something's a little rotten in Denmark. So it's it's a very interesting um, read. I'll include it in the in in the the show notes if if you want to uh, peruse it on your own. Th these will be available on on YouTube on the YouTube channel. Uh, go and click the link for the Twitter thing. I, I, this thing could be probably like 200 tweets long. He's been adding it there. Yeah, Gabby Wasensteiner, uh, CNBC Partnerships and Marketing Manager. I mean, she might even be doing her job by trying to forge a partnership with. Um, <laughs> with Bitcoin Cash, but the fact it's not openly disclosed is rubs some people the wrong way. Because here's her husband, Paul Wasensteiner, who's executive director of the Bitcoin Cash Fund. Another example of just how reputable these Bitcoin Cash people are, not necessarily Paul and Gabby, is that uh, Roger K. Ver owns the owns the uh, Earl 
the URL to Bitcoin.com. And so when you go to, so if you're new and you go to Bitcoin.com, it's actually sending you to a Bitcoin Cash site. If you create a Bitcoin wallet off Bitcoin.com, you're actually creating a Bitcoin Cash wallet. And, D, and another thing that's mm. re really kind of pissed off us true coiners, uh, you know, us, us old coiners, <clears throat> is that the, he, he started calling Bitcoin Cash the true Bitcoin, called you know Bitcoin Bitcoin Core. No, it's freaking Bitcoin, <laughs> and and he, everything in everything he's done has just been in a way to delegitimize, you know, the, the the original, the OG cryptocurrency, the cryptocurrency that made all cryptocurrencies possible, Bitcoin. So that's where we are with that. <laughs> Any My thoughts? comment to this would be, um, this is this is a conspiracy theory. It really is. Like I, I don't know what else to say besides that. Um, the woman that is allegedly connected to the Bitcoin cash fund, I have no idea who that woman, woman is. I've never heard of her. She works in London. She's not sitting in the CNBC newsroom. You know what I mean? So I, I just, I, it, it's a little, um, it's a little far flung, I think, but it's, it's that's very, all I'm going to say about friendly. that. You're absolutely right. It's very Oh, totally. <laughs> and, and you know, when you send it to me, I was like, what? And I was like, I, I work here. This is not what's, this is not what's happening. Um, um, uh, we, we've given that as much life as we probably need to, and and that's fine. But I just wanted to give, uh, I just I just wanted to give Fiat World an opportunity to, you know, to 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 uh, present its side of the case. And and you're right, it could, it could all be, you know, somewhat innocent. But you know, you gotta, especially with crypto these days, you have to be hyper vigilant on everything that's going on out there because there oh, are so sure. many scams and pump and dumps and ICOs which just super fail. Oh sure, I mean. I this goes back to something that I feel like we've talked about before. Um, you know, there's some folks in the media world doing some really fair, good work, but you know, in 20 years, the media might look back and kind of laugh at itself and the way that I think about it or the way that I imagine it might play out is, do you remember the video of Mark Zuckerberg first going on CNBC um, and a host asked him, Mark, what is the Facebook? And it's kind of gone viral as the years have come on because it's just so ridiculous. Right. You know what I mean? Like the I way she asked. I watched Social Network the other day. That movie still holds up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great film. Anyway, I just wonder if, if it'll play out a little bit like like that. You know, like we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, I feel I feel like a lot of people who are covering this stuff. Like I don't know if we understand it as as well as someone like you does. You have skin in the game, EJ. Like I. I don't trade cryptocurrencies. I can only learn as much as I can from someone like you. But you, you know, five, if I you still got that five dollars worth, right? I mean, it might be worth a little less right now, but it's... yeah, it's worth five dollars and thirty cents. Last time I checked, but it, it did peak at at one point to, to almost thirteen bucks, which is Ooh. awesome. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll be there should, again. Uh... Well, we're still going to the moon, damn it! We're gonna hit like twenty five k this year. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> you know, I remain skeptical, so we'll yeah, see. Well, and that's why we love having you on, Cordy. That's why we love having you on. All right, so the next thing, a third of wealthy individuals are in or plan to enter the cryptocurrency market. Are high net worth individuals flocking to crypto outside of the TV show Billions, which I absolutely love? Have you seen Billions? you watch Billions? Oh, my God. I love Billions. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. One million in straight I'm glad crypto. we can agree on that because because there are a lot of shows you bring up. And I'm like, I've never heard of this show. But I billions... watch so much TV. I've got no kids, no girlfriend, no life. I just watch stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, though. So when you bring up these shows, I'm like, why have I never heard of this? I watch a ton of TV, way more than I should. Should be doing other things. Well, it's anyway. your job, though, right? I mean, you are a segment producer. Guess who's hot in them streets? It is not my job to watch um Billions. like wild wild country on netflix three that times was, in a row like wild. that's you know not what? my you job for our last segment i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna give you start thinking right now i'm gonna give you an opportunity okay. also to, to add for the culture because i had no idea you were such a tv head it'd be very interesting to see what you're watching when we get to that segment um but, but yeah okay so, i got so, one i got one i'm pretty okay. i'm okay, ready good. So, so back to the the hnwi so do you so outside mm. of fictional TV shows that we watch, uh, do you find do you, you hear people? Maybe they come by the set, or or you know, just in some scuttlebutt or just around the industry. Do you hear people are actually you know like wealthy individuals or are you know d diving deeper into crypto? No, I do not hear that. But oh. that just could yeah. be because of the types of people that I'm interacting on a day to day basis. Um, so I'm not saying they're not out there. I just they're not on my radar except for you know what i read online like i read about hedge fund managers dipping their feet into bitcoin i think bill miller who's like a pretty 
storied investor um, has is interested in crypto, and he he's a billionaire. So that's one, I guess. Um, so so, so, so I hadn't think it's still like the mm -hmm. the really forward thinkers or the really kind of guys who take more risk who are talking about getting into crypto. Yeah, and I mean, even in this story, this firm that did this survey, um, what they say is that the surveys the survey's findings demonstrate that high net worth individuals are increasingly unable to ignore the huge potential of cryptocurrencies. And I'm like, well, duh. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just a little vague. I, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people out there who think that crypto has huge potential, and I I know you know that. Um, I I just think it's a it's a little vague, and I'm like wondering where the why is. Um, <laughs> this is a non-story. <laughs> yeah, and then and then and then I'm also wondering like the when the when was if that makes sense. Like, when did they start seeing this demand? Is this like in the last week? In the last oh, year? Gotcha. I, I I couldn't find that. But I mean, this firm is legit, right? It has like ten billion dollars assets under management. I don't doubt that it that they're seeing some sort of demand. I just want more details. Well, the day of the article is June first, but yes, it does not say exactly when it was pulled. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Well, nothing to see here. We're moving on. <laughs> we got other things. Um, Venezuela. I mean, my question. Oh, can I yeah. ask one one more question about sure. that? No. Do you even want these types of people co-signing cryptocurrency? Like, are these the people that these these kind of um, more traditional, older, not necessarily a Warren Buffett type, but mm -hmm. you know, buying into cryptocurrency? Well, it's it's a double edged sword because so, for example, back. Oh, man, I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago, but like six, seven months ago, whatever, when it was <clears throat> when the rumor was confirmed that that there would be Bitcoin futures uh, coming. We mm -hmm. thought it'd be a big gold rush and, and everything would happen. And of course, the stock has reversed. And, and if you really want to get into the weeds and stuff, maybe on the next on your next uh, appearance on the podcast, we can talk about this. But basically, all it it enabled were uh, wealthy or big whales and trading groups to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. That's pretty much all. I mean, it's been kind of proven through charts and science and, 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 <clears throat> and, uh, anecdotally, but basically, um, by allowing Bitcoin futures, it's actually, you know, tanked the price because there's just been so much market manipulation. You'll see these run-ups and then drops almost coinciding with the cashing out of these Bitcoin futures. So, <clears throat> so on one hand, you're like, nope, we don't need any more of that nefarious behavior or whatever, but, on the other hand, the only way that Bitcoin and crypto generally is, is going to achieve its real true potential is through mass adoption. And sadly, America is a country that overbelieves in the wisdom of rich people. I mean, look look at our look at our government, look at our president. Not just our president. I mean, a lot of people in positions of power are really wealthy people, and we just kind of we give them a pass. We kind of you know, and we kind of believe that they must know better than we do because they have more money. And so, if a, if for example Warren Buffett you know makes you know a, a 180 and decides that he wants to get into crypto, I mean that could that would be huge for crypto. Hell, even Jamie Dimon quietly is into crypto now you know i mean it's not even so much like he's not bashing he's just he's his jp morgan's doing stuff for crypto they've got like you know they hired that that woman uh, amber Baudelaire or uh, Baudet or something she i mean you know they've got like a whole little division now so it's gonna get there but once again it's 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 stealth it's quiet and it's, it seems to be you know at on at the highest rungs of finance and power and people who do take more risk. Your traditionalists aren't going to get into crypto until it's, I wouldn't say it's too late, but it'll be more expensive for them, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Gotcha. Mm, I don't know. I, I was thinking kind of what you were thinking, like had Warren Buffett come on CNBC that morning or even Charlie Munger, who I think is pretty respected in the community, um, come on our network and said, this is interesting, you know, not even maybe not a full on endorsement, just this is interesting, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is what Bill Gates has been on the record saying before he came on our show earlier this month and said that he wished that he could find a way to short it. Um, I think <laughs> I think you would have seen. <laughs> oh, we did a story on that. I, I didn't read it, by the, but we did do a story on that. Um, anyway, I think had he said that, um, you know, you would have seen a reflection in like the price of cryptocurrencies. Like I think after they made those comments, cryptocurrencies like dipped a little, mm -hmm. at least according to the to the way we track them. Right. Um so I don't know. I don't know. I think I think I think you have a good point when you say that should someone who's hyper influential from the traditional kind of investing wor world, you know, give Bitcoin or other altcoins an endorsement, 
I don't see why that's bad. It sends the price up, right? Or at yeah. least I imagine it would. You would, you would think so. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens when Goldman Sachs officially opens its trading desk. Uh, I think yeah. it's supposed to be this summer. Um, I mean, they're the vampire squid. I mean, if there's ever a sign that Bitcoin's not going anywhere, it's 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 a uh, it's Goldman Sachs. I don't th I don't know if it will bring you know much stability to it, but sentiment and this is still a highly you know sentiment driven market uh, because it's so small and so new. Uh, I it, it'll it, it's just stay tuned, everybody. Stay tuned, y'all. <laughs> stay tuned. And on to Venezuela. Uh, our, our, our brothers to the, to the south, South America. Um, I'm from Panama, so my my uh, my compatriot neighbors, they're going through some things right now. <laughs> Venezuela is banning crypto mining rigs, I guess, and it's been rumored that they're like outright stealing uh, stuff. Like if if I wanted to, if you want to send some stuff to someone in Venezuela, like I guess like an ASIC card or something, like I don't know, ASIC rig or something, I don't know, it won't get to them. They're getting jacked. Uh, what have you heard about this story, CB? So I, I remember when they announced that their, um, the, the Petro coin, I remember when that was oh, announced. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that sound you just made. Yes. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's back the cryptocurrency by a state. That's going to be awesome. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had read initially that Petros were going to be pre-mined, right? Like meaning that the government would produce and control it, which is what you're alluding to, yes. right? Mm -mm. So when I saw this story, um, and it, it was on my Twitter timeline before you sent it to me in the rundown this morning, um, I initially thought, oh, duh, it has to be because, you know, mining drives electricity costs like way up. And then I was like, wait a second, no. <laughs> electricity is state subsidized, so it's like so cheap there. So, so, so cheap. And you can also do like a different way too. You can do what's called proof of stake, which doesn't really cost any energy. Just holding the coin actually helps, you know, uh, solidify the network and and add value to the coin but they don't want to hear that though go ahead <laughs> i read this is a cool stat um i read that mining a bitcoin in venezuela costs less than a hundred dollars hmm. mining a bitcoin in china sixteen hundred dollars mining a bitcoin in the u.s twenty five hundred dollars i don't know how accurate that is but i thought that was like an wow. interesting comparison wow, so i mean this is, awesome. yeah it's, it's it's a great stat right um yeah. so i guess this has to do with government control right government the government wanting to kind of control what's going on that that's my guess i mean what have what have you heard well i, I would i would agree with that the <clears throat> well maybe two things going on at once uh the government wanted, wanted to control stuff as governments would want to do also their venezuela is facing has faced a lot is facing a lot of sanctions and and having trouble like just in in general with their economy and so oh, yeah. they and so, and that's what that's what I thought the Petro was like a big play at was just them trying to create another way of wealth that can get around sanctions and things of that nature. And also, uh, and because I, their their oil, I think they still have like a lot of oil in Venezuela, but oh, not yeah. as many takers because we've got they've got all these sanctions on them. So it's just them really trying to control the cryptocurrency process in their country. And so I saw I almost included this link. Um, I I'm not gonna look it up, but basically. <clears throat> Their their currency, the Bolivar, it costs mm -hmm. like like two point one million Bolivar to make one dollar, and someone showed like what two point oh, one million Bolivar look like. It's like a it's like a, a big pile, and someone's like, oh, it looks, <laughs> it looks like nice to start a fire with, you know? It's just yeah. it, their their currency is, is becoming more and more worthless, and so and and so in turn, you've seen a lot of Venezuelans flock to cryptocurrency, if you can imagine that, as something stable, which is what we've seen throughout you know, crypto's, you know, brief history back in, was it 2014, 2015, Argentina had a lot of, you know, uh, issues with, with their peso. And so you, that would drive the price of crypto up. Uh, when you had issues in Cyprus, that drove the pr price of crypto up. Now, back then, driving the price of crypto up was like $20, $30 a time. We got all so excited. But now, uh, but now it, 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 there's been a history of crypto as a bit of a safe haven, if you can imagine that, for, you know, uh, states that are in turmoil. And I would argue the fact that now it's Trump versus everybody. We're even having trade wars with freaking Canada. Y'all might want to get some crypto too. <laughs> everyone, yeah. wants, everyone might need to get some crypto because uh, the because when you have an unstable government and you, you can't trust the currency, you can't trust the economy, you know, who's going to save us? What, what happens? Let me ask you this, Courtney. What happens when the current global world's reserve currency is under a government that is more and more unreliable and reckless. Uh, the dollar goes down. Are you talking about the U.S. dollar? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, we we yeah. still are the global reserve currency, right? 
last time I checked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And and that's and that's also why I think crypto is. I mean, I, I hate to be that guy. Oh, crypto's going to change the world and stuff, and and it probably will, honestly. But something. But I really believe that eventually we will have the world will have to get to a place where the dollar is replaced with a stateless, you know, crypto you know, graphical asset like, you know, Bitcoin or something that we can all say, okay, that's going to be the world's reserve currency. Uh, and I mean, it, you know, I'm not even totally against them even create, well, you know, you can never get 190 countries, whatever, on the same page with anything, to be honest with you. But I mean, if, if even the major players, the G20 were like, all right, we're going to, you know, say that Bitcoin's the global reserve asset because Donald Trump's an ass clown, then I'm kind of for that because now, I mean, it, it it's always dangerous when one when one person you know has to or one, or one entity has too much power and now that we're not as much a reliable trade partner or economic partner i'd be highly surprised if we don't see the global reserve currency going to something in uh that's a cryptocurrency um we had um a gentleman on our network a few just earlier this week actually um muhammad alarian um He's, he, he does TV a lot. He was up for a role in the Fed. Um, he's an economist and he kind of said something similar a little bit to what you're saying. Um, he was predicting that he thinks maybe not in the next five years, the next 10 years, but um, there will ev eventually be like a government issued cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. But he's not saying it in response to like there being you know global turmoil and having doubt about the US dollar, more so in the sense that um, no one's using cash anymore. So sure. the government's going to get on board with that and kind of issue their own type of cryptocurrency, which I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's going to yeah. say, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that made me think of that. Oh, and that reminds me of the story we're not going to touch on. Uh, this would be like 5A thing. Is, um, <laughs> is, is <laughs> Well, actually, well, yeah, actually, this, is, this kind of bleeds into our next story. So we'll get to our next story. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, Bittrex started uh, offering USD pairs, and meaning that they're allowing... Uh, the U.S. dollar to be traded on their their exchange, Bitrex, U.S. based, um, and and so base, but it's a slow rollout because it's there. I actually checked my Bitrex account the day it was announced, and it's there. It's I've got there's a USD wallet. I can't deposit cool. to it. I can't withdraw from it. <laughs> but if somehow I'm eventually actually, though, right? Yeah, eventually. eventually. Right now, I think we're starting with corporate mm -hmm. partners, um, right? And and certain states. I live in Nevada. We are not there yet. And so, and so the day this came out, I actually um, put something in your soon to be new home, black people in cryptocurrency. Uh, I, put, I put a link Facebook to the, group. You know, <laughs> the Facebook group. I put a link in to the, to the article and said, GG, USD Tether. <laughs> and for those of you who aren't familiar, USD Tether is, oh my God, you want to talk about Ponzi schemes. All right, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so, <laughs> USD Tether, so a, is it, Okay, let me get this straight. Um, an exchange, I want to say, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, so I'm not going to say, but there, there's an exchange that kind of backed the creation of USD Tether, which is a cryptocurrency, which is tied, tethered to the US the dollar, US right? dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you ever, and, and it's actually pretty, I mean, if you ever go on like CoinMarketCap and check to see like what the price is, I mean, it's always super duper, yeah, cookie, it's always super duper steady, right? USD, yeah, here it is, see? 99, you know, 93 cents, right? It's always within, you know, you know, 1% of a dollar generally, right? It, it's, it's supposed to be fairly stable. And allegedly, in, look at 3 billion in, um, what is that? Oh, that's 3 billion in volume. All right, 3 billion volume, in volume, yeah. 2.5 billion in, in a total market cap, right? Now, allegedly, they're saying that for every $1 of this this uh, this cryptocurrency, there is a dollar backed of Tether, right? But it was mm -hmm. revealed through, for, you know, I'm not even sure if it was friends accounting. It was just like some simple accounting or an audit or something months ago that the company that runs Tether does not have all the dollars to back this up. And I don't know, understand why this isn't like a bigger scandal or people aren't worried or whatever. And I get it that a lot of markets trade on margin and stuff, but mm -hmm. this is the only the only reason for this, this thing's existence is the fact that it's supposed to be a digitized dollar tied to the price of a dollar. And they don't even have enough dollars. What do you think about Talk that? Talk me through what the implication of that is though. So if like I bought into Tether and I wanted to cash out, are you saying that they wouldn't be able to, like what what is the implication of them not having the dollars to back that. 
It's well, you know what? Actually, okay, here's a great, here's a good example. It's the same thing as like having a run on the bank, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. No, I mean banks have liquidity levels, ratios, whatever, which are <laughs> getting chipped away every day with this new Congress. Good lord! Uh, but uh, it would be the same thing as if everyone who had a tether either lost faith or interest in the tether and and just sold it off for Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or whatever and just got rid of it. They don't have enough dollars to back this up. The price would actually drop within this 1% down to like less than a dollar. And then it would, it, there'd really be no reason for it to exist. There's not enough. I, if there was ever a run on the bank, <clears throat> everyone cashing their tether for US dollars, there's not enough dollars to cover the tether is what I'm saying. Like gotcha, not even gotcha. close. And right. I just, I mean, how are you going to, you know, market yourself as like, a, a, you know, being backed by the dollar. We don't have enough dollars. <sighs> Huh. That that is a good that's a good story. <laughs> if, if it yeah, hasn't been done yet. Yeah, I'm gonna look into that. You know, segment producer. Yeah, yeah look into that. <laughs> uh, so so anyways, um so what's kinda interesting with this is that it's gonna I mean Bitrex is, is pretty large, I think like, you know, in the top ten of exchanges. I think they were recently acquired um by uh somebody, like someone on Wall Street, I think. So they're making more and more uh strides for more marketplace legitimacy i guess you'd say and so this is this is really big uh, it'll be bigger when i can actually deposit some us dollars yeah. know, instead of on coinbase but yeah this, this this is big what do what do you guys think so i have a question actually your cursor is right near the quote that i wanted to ask you about oh, so okay. this gentleman d did a few interviews some on cnbc uh some on bloomberg one thing he said to bloomberg was that um you know this partnership is important or this deal is important because it's mm -hmm. about the banks being able to trust crypto CEO in general Bill shihara right yes okay. yes so um so i read that line and i was like what <laughs> it, because from my understanding and please correct me if i'm wrong from my understanding in the recording that i've done um, the whole point and the whole allure of cryptocurrency was to kind of get the banks out, right? Give them less power. <laughs> but now he's saying that the banks need to trust. Why do the banks need to trust cryptocurrency? I just, I'm, I'm not clear on that. <laughs> oh, Courtney, <laughs> you didn't think they'd go down so easy, would you? Come I mean, on, I guess. No, no, they're, look, these... I mean, they're they're dead men walking. They don't know it yet, but they're they're dead men walking, and it's gonna be a while though. It's it's gonna be a while. Um, there are as I as I love trotting out this this little um, line because it's true. There are over three hundred and fifty trillion dollars in in assets, currency, and real estate in the in the world. Three hundred fifty trillion. The cryptocurrency market is isn't even half a trillion yet. All that yeah. stuff's gonna be digitized and put on a blockchain. And yeah, I got I, I just love I love saying this because it's, it's so true. And my thing is is that the banks aren't going to go down without a fight. They're going to figure out a way to stay involved. Where is it? Uh, I can't find it. Anyways, uh, it, I, I love yeah here it is. I love um, touting that um, that figure because it's oh that's the wrong one because it's true. And they're going to find a way to make them keep themselves as relevant as possible until we don't need them. But they're going to be whole classes. Uh, in, in, of industries just wiped out. You're not gonna, I mean, you're not gonna need, you know, escrow, you know, title companies. I mean, voting's gonna be changed. I mean, so much, I mean, you know, probably a after a while, accountants, the, the, mm -hmm. the legal profession may, you know, see some some sweeping uh, changes, especially on some stuff that's like automatic, or, you know, just automatically handled that you don't need people for. So you're gonna see a lot of things just are either automated or replaced with trustless systems and it, especially the way we're heading now with the recent um, changes to uh, the weakening of like glass steagle and what have you, you're going to see, I mean, <clears throat> we're going to have another recession and it's going to be bad. And crypto is actually going to look really good coming out of this. And maybe that might be the impetus for getting rid of the banks, but they're going to do what banks do. Um, and uh, unless they're, unless they're smart, I mean, Honestly, the big, the smartest thing banks could do is to partner with crypto because not only does it give them a backstop from the global economy crashes again to, due to their own malfeasance, but also it'll give them some sort of weak credibility that well we're we're still in crypto, you know, you can still kind of trust us because you know crypto you know isn't fiat. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking my ass. What do you think, Courtney? I I I guess I guess where what my question is is. I understand why the banks would want to partner with, you know, companies like Bittrex, right? Exchanges like Bittrex. Why would Bittrex want to partner with, with them? Why, why? You know what I mean? I feel like that's like sitting 
um, at a dinner table one on one with your enemy, you know, what I would perceive <laughs> to be the enemy, you, you know, you're kind of watching what they're doing with their knife, right? You're not, I, I don't know. I well, don't, I don't quite understand that. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a marketing and an adoption issue right now. Everyone's tied to fiat. All they know is, mm -hmm. is cash dollars, you know, PayPal, if they're, you know, <laughs> if, if they're lucky, whatever they're, they're, they're tied to fiat system and that's fine. I, I, we, I totally get it, but this is Bittrex partnering with, a fiat bank is basically just trying to, it, it's user acquisition. There we go. It's user acquisition. It's like, you know, mm. you know, like a discounted, you know, you know, whatever to get you in the door. Right. And once you're in the door they they plan to expose you to a whole lot of stuff. I I'm getting now a weekly email from circle team circle, you know, which was acquired, you know, uh, partially by Goldman Sachs and they, yeah. and they're like, I mean, I, I give up to their marketing. They're like, you know, Every, I think this past week they had something like get to know the coins. We got this coin and this coin and this coin, and I'm like, oh, for a newbie, this is like really smart. So this, it's all, it's all a marketing play. Get them in the door, get them hooked on crypto, and eventually, once technology and society take over, I mean, you know, banks will. I mean, I'm not even sure if banks will face a decision. They, they just might go the way of J.C. Penney in the mall. Like seriously, straight up, Sears closed another 60 stores this week. I mean, when's the last time you've been to a Sears? <laughs> So. Uh, never, never. That's, that's right, my lovely millennial. That's right, that's right. <laughs> all right, and our last story, and this one we might have already touched on, but this, it, this is all you, Courtney. What is hot? What's the hottest crypto topic in those CNB streets? What's the hot? What are you all talking about on the Squawk Box set? What's my lovely Melissa Lee into? I mean, you know, you know. What, uh, well, on? you saw, right? I, I think you're not so happy with her, right, because of the Bitcoin Cash thing. Well, but, that, but that's that, that's not your show. You're like she's okay. Yeah, no, it's her show. Yeah, it's her show. Oh, fast. That's right, fast money. Yeah. Mostly, yeah. funny. Thing, I was like putting Mostly and husband was the next one. Oops. Oh, was that gosh. a tell on my Google results? <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, so yeah, um, yeah. So what are you guys talking about? Like last time you were on, you were talking about Zcash. You know, that, yeah. that seemed behind the streets. Zcash has actually gained some some profile since then. But what what, what are you guys talking about these days on set? I feel like in the last few weeks, at least, we've been talking a lot less about the altcoins. Um, I'm going to speak for not CNBC. I'm going to speak for myself and kind of um, the, the the kind of conversation that we've been having in our little cubicles. So um, we've been having this debate. Um, we often, and not just CNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, they often have people like Robert Schiller, who's a Nobel laureate, calling for the extinction of Bitcoin, Bitcoin, right? And then you have others who are saying that traditional payment, traditional the traditional dollar as we know it, is also going to be in, extinct in 10 years. I'm not saying either is impossible. I'm not. I truly don't know. But where is where are the middle ground folks, the people who think that Bitcoin and, you know, and the dollar can exist? I don't know if side by side is the right way to kind of um, say it, but but can't both things be good? Can't both things exist in a big way? Where's the nuance? You know what I mean? Like, why does it have to be completely different polar opposites of the scale? Doesn't be zero sum is what you're saying, right? <laughs> exactly. And I understand the people who are making these calls are more, I don't know, more entertaining. It's, it's your, someone's more often to click, but I, I'm just wondering where Myself and you know other people I speak to in the building. Where is the middle ground? Like, why does it have to be one or the other? Why can't it be both? So, I don't know if you have a do you, answer do you, for me, but well, I mean, well, I'm actually I just have another question. Do you feel it's because yeah. um, because people who do come by on your sets who do watch CNBC, the the titans of industry, and and people who you know who've made a pretty comfortable fiat living for themselves, do you feel they, they feel threatened? by the potential of, of Bitcoin that so they feel like they must just put it down just I mean we don't want to I mean or or do you think it's more of uh, get off my lawn I don't want to have to learn something new and adapt type of thing well sure maybe um but it's not like technologist I guess is what I'm right but it's not like we're just having the Warren Buffetts the Charlie Mungers and I'm just using them as an example because it's the first thing off the top of my head it's not like we're having those types of people on every day we're also having we we have the Coinbase CEO on quite often we have executives from Coinbase on quite often so it's we we do we do get both sides but it's it's, it's rare that we get someone um, you know, we, ha we always have this really great thinker, Silicon Valley thinker, Chamath Palihapitiya. Um, and 
he 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 is someone who will come on our set and he's very smart and he's someone that people respect and you know he's a big proponent of bitcoin he's a big big proponent of cryptocurrency so we do get both sides of the debate i'm just wondering like why why is it always two extremes it's like kind of like our politics today right you know like <laughs> where is the <laughs> We're very the moderate. Tribal. Very tribal. We're the moderates. Well, you know, um, that's why we have you on, Courtney, you know, because you're we're, we're bridging the divide on this podcast right now. You and yeah, I. Uh-huh. You're, you're, you're the voice we'll of moderation. I'm kind of the voice of, like, technology and experience, but also, like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a pragmatist. Like, I know, I know banks aren't going away tomorrow as much as, you know, us old coiners would love them to. So, you know, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It doesn't have to be zero sum, but... I think eventually, you know, technology and progress just takes over. And I think the bank's going to fight that tooth and nail because they have very entrenched interests. And it'll be very interesting to see what, it, I mean, the best case scenario for, for Bitcoin and for all us uh, old coiners, whatever, it was that, you know, the idea of like, you know, blockchain and decentralization and and basically, you know, a bit, a bit of a digital democracy, it was very attractive. That's why it attracted the libertarians at first and, you know, all the people who were like, you know, just leave me alone, let me do my thing. It'll be very interesting to see as crypto, you know, digitizes those $350 trillion in assets and all in different areas of our life. It'll be very interesting to see if there's an actual mindset change in society as people become more and more familiar and comfortable with the technology. Because at, at the core of it, if you take it to its nth degree, I mean, there are some really radical ideas which are being played out you know, uh, through the veil of finance um, and, and uh, with what crypto, cryptocurrency can do. Um, I, and this kind of leads me into you know, uh, our next segment for The Culture, uh, the show I've been watching, which is called Startup. It's a show on, oh, bless its heart, uh, on Crackle, Sony's Crackle. You're like, what the hell is a Crackle? And basically... It's a streaming service. It's it's free. Um, I have like a, I guess I have like a Sony TV or something, and so and I'd always kind of how do I how do, oh man you, you gotta I can't even get that's so dumb. How can I get past this? I can't even search. That's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> these pop-ups are killing me. Um, so it's it's basically there we go. Uh, it's basically a streaming service. Uh, that's free. You have to sit through ads, and there are some wild product placements <laughs> in this show. It's like, okay, we get it, Blue Moon. We get it, you know, uh, we get it, Dove. You guys are our partners. But basically, no one watches, no one watches this this channel or whatever because no one knows about it. It's a really good show though. It's basically about this group of uh, this group of people: a white dude, a Cubana tech star, and a Haitian gangster, all in from different sides of Miami, who band together to start a new cryptocurrency. And it is good. It's like really fun. And I'm only like. Like on there's only two seasons out third season comes back september 1st um i'm only and they added ron perlman to the cast in season two it's a really good show and and basically they they tackle some of those themes like you know she's trying to create like a a new cryptocurrency called gen coin which is you know anonymized and decentralized and all sort of stuff and and i can really relate to it because they're, they talk a lot about like startup politics and snaking and dealing and all sort of stuff and so and it, it, it's a it's a it's a tv show it's a thriller i mean it's not you're not just gonna sit there and you know watch paint dry like most startups there's like you know drugs and murder and sex and you know it's a really good show <laughs> oh i, I oh, saw gosh. your eyes go like yeah no you how, did, how did you find this it's on my tv i've got like a, a sony or something and, if, and under the streaming options there's like crackle and i always kind of laughed ha <laughs> crackle and they, but they had uh, they showed like uh like a, a, a one sheet for their show startup i'm like hell i run a startup oh, cinema no. draft so let me just click <laughs> and i watched the pilot and i was hooked it's a good show it's funny because okay my, what's better my... startup or silicon valley I mean, one's a comedy, one's like a hard drama. I mean, it's like comparing The Wire to The Office. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, but if I had to say which one was better, I would say The Wire by far. It's a <laughs> well, way better yes, show. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, wow, wow. What? No, this is not my interview. This, no, I was kidding. Wow, you put me in a really tough spot. I did not even think about that. That is wild because I, I really liked Silicon Valley's uh, latest season. I thought last season, the season before, was a little lackluster. And then the previous season before that were all really good. So, oh, man, that's tough. And, and obviously, I'm partial to this recent season of Silicon Valley because they went all in on ICOs. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. My, Courtney, oh, my gosh. All right. I, we need to talk about EJ, this real quick. Oh, my gosh. Have yes. you have you 
seen – have you heard about Pied Piper coin? Yes, I I have actually. You're going to ask me what I want, what I'm working on at the end, aren't you? And it, it, it plays into what I'm working on right now. Then, actually, then the floor is yours. Talk, talk to me about what you're working on because the Pied Piper coin is real and it is bananas. Okay, but why bananas? Okay, all right. So, all right. So, for those of you who don't follow Silicon Valley, it's based on this this, this startup, uh, tech startup, and in season five, I think, which we just had, uh, it's a way to raise mm -hmm. funds. They decide they're going to do an ICO, which a lot of companies are doing right now, and <clears throat> uh, using like extra units of their computing power, whatever, as like their their basis of of, of exchange. And so basically, and so by the end of the season, they launch their coin. They call it Pied Piper Coin because the name of the company is Pied Piper, and it and <laughs> the the irony is that it's only worth like seven cents right well doesn't go well for them right doesn't go doesn't well go for well for them in the show yeah initially right so mm -hmm. leave it to let me see if i can find it. leave it to the internet <laughs> to take the and because when this first came out we thought it was we all thought this was just like some clever um marketing from hbo Apparently it's not. Not affiliated yeah, yeah. with HBO. All right. So just so just some guys, some bros probably got together like, hey, let's make this joke coin called Pied Piper Coin. It's totally easy to make a token mm -hmm. these days because the code's out there for an ERC20 token, and if you have even modest development skills, you can make your own token. You can make Courtney to Courtney Coin. I can make Eduardo Coin. Whatever. Right. Doesn't really have a value <clears throat> or anything. You know, but you can just make it. And this is what these guys did. They they had a really good, solid social media marketing game. Um, attracted, you know, made, were really snarky, engaged a lot of different influencers in the community, um, and and got like a lot of traction. And they decided they would have what's called an airdrop, which is the marketing uh, exercise where you just give out your coin for free, right? So they allotted a certain amount of their token supply to an airdrop. I signed up. I'm like, oh, this is a joke. Ha ha ha. This will be nice and kitschy, whatever. They'll send me an ERC20 token that doesn't do anything, right? <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so they airdropped about, I guess, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I got mine. I actually got mine twice. They were airdropping everyone 750 PPI. That's a, that's the ticker symbol. <laughs> I ended up getting it twice because I guess they had some leftovers. So I have 1500 PPI. <laughs> oh my God! Check this out. That's not a good sign if you got it twice, right? Eh, I mean, who cares? Not regulated, right? Anyways, mm. this sucker's worth 1.5 million in market cap. Somebody started trading these free tokens on Ether Delta, and what's the other? What's the other exchange? On Ether Delta and DDX, DDEX, DDEX. Mm -hmm. They had three. They had. Three, they had 4,000 in volume in the last 24 hours. Who's trading these? They don't do anything. They don't buy anything. It is a joke coin. You know, it's like Dogecoin. I guess I, guess I shouldn't be so, so surprised because Dogecoin, which is basically created because people like dogs. I, I used to call it doggy coin before I knew what people were calling it. It's mm -hmm. a joke coin that now has a market cap of 1.5 million. This so is that nuts. is... That is exactly what I am trying to do a story on. Maybe some of your listeners can help me out here. So it, I literally have written down in my notes here, joke coins, um, because <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated by this. As someone who is not in this world the way you are, it's just like, what? Because when this, when this, when when I first saw this Twitter account, I was like, oh, how funny. I knew it wasn't affiliated with HBO, but I knew, I thought it was just like a play off of the show. I didn't realize it was real. So it's like at what point do these joke coins become real? Some of them are still joke, you know. It's just how does it work? Um, I don't, I don't know how I can start reporting on this, but I've had this idea for some time now. So maybe you can help. <laughs> well, I, I, here, here's the first stop in your research. The Merkle has the top three new joke coins: Rat Poison yeah. Squared Coin. That sounds kind of personal. <laughs> That sounds kind, okay. of, kind, of, kind yeah. of targeted. Sounds like um, a shot at Charlie Munger. You know? Yeah. Uh, but so, but what, what I find really fascinating about the whole uh, Pied Piper coin experience is that it actually gave some of us in marketing a new playbook. Uh, because especially, so one of the issues with ICOs opening in the States is that, you know, they're, you know the SEC is trying to figure out how to regulate its security, they're putting all these yeah. onerous restrictions on it, you know, which largely bullshit, if you ask me, for just accredited investors. I mean, it's it's chilling the effect of raise. Like, I wanted to participate in the Telegram um, ICO. I couldn't because, one, I'm not a high net worth individual or an accredited investor. And two, yeah. before they even decide to open up to the larger ICO, and I mean, there's going to be like a, a 
three to five billion dollar ICO. They just shut it down because they already had 1.7 billion. They want to deal with North America and the stupid SEC rules, and they were out. Well, that really kind of pissed me off and annoyed me. But now, from a marketing standpoint, if I were coming out with a legitimate coin or token or whatever, and I want to bypass the ICO process, just do an airdrop. If you give it away for free, and then you have some sort of like staking rewards, you know, policy, whatever, where, you know, it releases X amount of coins per month to the holders and stuff. It can't be. It's not investable security. It's just out there. Just like this one. I mean, this they just airdropped all their coins. I got it for free. And now I'm sitting on, what is it, 42, 43 cents times 1500 mm. $640 for basically filling out a two-minute Google form with an ETH address. It's nuts. And and anyone listening out there who's interested in getting into these hot, you know, hot, hot, hot Pied Piper coin markets, I have a standing sell order for $10 a coin on Ether Delta. So please pump my bags. Thank you. <laughs> the people who listen to your your podcast are going to hate me. I, I think like when people say what people are afraid of is exactly what you're describing because that sounds I'll use the word you used, bananas to me. Absolutely <laughs> bananas. Like, like I just, it doesn't sound like there has to be a catch. Like, what is the catch? What? Well, what do you? Th I mean, you, what, so here's. So it's funny because when people were saying the same thing you were thinking too, they're getting at them on social media as well, and because they're like, it's too good to be true. It's weird. I don't get it. Um, mm -hmm. There's got to be. A, I mean, there, it's got to be a scam, right? But where is the scam? I mean, they gave it out for free. No, I mean, the, the, why? Marketplace, why? the marketplace decided its own value. We're supposed to be all free market, you know, um, capitalists out here. So mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's it's kind of, it's really brilliant. And honestly, it's shown me a way forward as far as like if you're creating a token and you want to, you know, and, and you want to not have it be like a security, just airdrop that sucker and let the market decide its value. You don't think the SEC is going to catch up with that? But But how? I mean, they didn't, I mean... All right, well, maybe you can maybe you can enlighten me on this because if if someone just kind of gives something away and people ascribe their own value to it, I don't understand how it's like a security. How it's it, it doesn't pass the Howey test, if you ask me, because no one's buying it yeah, initially no, that's true. to yeah. start it. I, I mean, yeah. I have an MBA. No, you're right. But, I mean, that's true. I'm, you know, I'm but I'm not like you know a market. <laughs> I do not person. have an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have an MBA. No, you no, got me you, you have an MFA. You have an MFA in uh, journalism. Once again, congratulations, strong MF. MF. Yeah, MF. <laughs> Thank you. I, I mean, I guess, I guess it's just the whole idea. Like, I just keep coming back to, okay, you got this thing for free. Am I missing something? Is this a stupid question? Like, what do they get? Well, now ha having decided, ha having let the market decide what the value is, what however many uh, tokens of this joke coin you're sitting on, they. They're sitting on a on, on an asset. They they can actually cash out, or I mean, they probably can't cash out all at once because they would tank the price. But they can cash out however much they feel comfortable with, whatever, and you know live off that or whatever, or help keep promoting it. What, and this mm -hmm. is and this is joke coin on top of joke coin because now the Pied Piper coin people have, and I'm not sure if they're the same people or I'm pretty. I think it might be a different group, but they've now joined up with Huli Coin. Yes, there is a Huli Coin. Oh, gosh. Have, have you heard about this? This is great. Um, no, but I guess it's not surprising. Um, I guess it's not surprising. So Huli Coin basically is like, all right, so, you know, and, and for those of you who don't watch Silicon Valley, Huli is kind of like the Google uh, stand-in, and they're highly centralized. Like a rival. Yes. A rival to Pied Piper a little bit, yeah. Exactly. They're their rival, and, and everything Pied Piper does, Huli just tries to rip off. Very More Facebook-like than anything, but anyways. Uh, and so Huli... Huli kind of came out with their own coin, and they've basically tied it to the fate of yeah. Look at it. See, this, this, this is the airdrop. <laughs> this <is> awesome. <laughs> you, so you can. So I think you had until like Friday to go to was it HuliChain.org? Huli something. Um, Huli Chain. Anyways, you uh, HuliChain.org. I think, and you can sign up for their airdrop. That doesn't seem right. Anyways, um, and, and and also if you already hold Pied Piper coin, they did a snapshot on Friday. What was the snapshot? Uh, 
and you see these are all like memes, right? It's just meme after meme after meme. It's yeah. truly a joke coin. So this snapshot, like fri like Saturday night, Friday morning, whatever, so, uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, and basically however many people who had PPI or, or whatever amount of PPI you had at the time of the snapshot, they were going to match with their Hui coin when it comes out. So that's number one, which hmm. I think is kind of brilliant. So they're tying their fate to their other joke coin. And number two, if you just, if you signed up by, I think by Friday, um, and submitted an ERC20 compliant Ethereum wallet address, you're going to get an airdrop. As a matter of fact, actually, did I, did they complete the airdrop? Let me see. I might, you know, after we're done, I might, I might need to check my ERC wallet. <laughs> oh, Look so at, you did sign up for this Huey coin. Yes. So I'm going to get some okay, Huey coin and also, um, they'll match the amount of Pied Piper coin I've got out there as well. This is like inception mm -hmm. level joke coining, Courtney. <laughs> It's fascinating it, to the point where I don't even know where to start asking questions. You, you, you know what I mean? I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but when I when I hear about things like this, I'm just like, what is happening? Okay. It's it's interesting, like internet culture too. You know? Yes. I don't know. And, and I'm here to help, Courtney. <laughs> I am here to help. So before we go, um, yes, what is your contribution for the culture? Because I I, I I I wrongly conflated what you're working on with for the culture. What is it that's inspiring that you're watching that's, you know, kind of filling your vessel? Hasn't started yet. Succession. <gasps> yes. On HBO tonight. Yes, Plus. queen. Yes. I'm so excited. What have you heard? Yes. Yeah. So I read a fascinating, fa fascinating article yesterday on CNN, actually, about, I didn't mean to say actually like that. <laughs> <laughs> CNN has great stuff. Um, no, I didn't realize Shade. that this was kind of a play on the Murdochs. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, the, the media yeah, empire that, thing. That's like, awesome. Oh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and I really like Jeremy awesome. Strong. He's, I mean... He, I mean, he, his, his profile is rising in Hollywood, but like he had like a really, he, he's always had a really sharp, memorable performance. Like he did, he had a, a supporting role in The Big Short, which is probably why Adam McKay, yep. who's behind The Big Short, cast him. He also cast has, him, yeah. has like a really, um, he, uh, he plays um, uh, Jessica Chastain's boss, or one of her first bosses in um, that Aaron Sorkin, uh, why, why am I going blank in this movie? It's the, the, the poker one. Um, she was just in this. Oh, uh... I don't um, know. Anyways, but he played he pl he played a really good role in that in the Eric, in Aaron mm -hmm. Sorkin's di directorial debut, um, the one with Jessica Chastain in it, and 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 just the trailers have been hot fire. I've been tweeting about this for a few weeks now. You think I was getting paid by HBO? I am not, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm very excited. I'm very excited about this, and and also it's it's like you know if you love Billions, it's kind of hard. And Billions is a hit show now for Showtime. It's kind of hard to see you wouldn't at least sample Succession on HBO. Yeah, that, that's a lot of what I was reading too. That this is kind of HBO's answer to billions. I I just hope it can last beyond one season. Some people who I've spoken to have said like, yeah, it's a great premise, but it's like, how do you keep this going for season after season? I'm like, well, billions has found a way to keep the beef between like a hedge fund manager and like the district attorney going for a few seasons now. So really I don't know. people are really worried a, about think sustainability. Think I, that's i mean well for, with my writer yeah. hat on because my background is 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 in writing i i don't see how you can stop this this is about yeah. the media and all and yeah you get super med and the me first of all one thing the media loves is the media they love themselves sorry no no shade but y'all love yourself so i'm mean, this thing's gonna last forever. i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> this thing's gonna last forever, and, I'll, and so it's part it's part media, and also it's part like King Lear, you know, and, you know, which of my daughters is gonna take over the the throne or whatever. So uh, you can you can have this run forever, in my estimation. Good, Just good. I'm glad you're optimistic about it. I'm super excited for this. It looks amazing. Well, let me ask so. you this real quick. Do you think that that mm -hmm. in our current uh, political and socioeconomic climate, um, where I mean, you know the the, the gap between the the income that was the income inequality gap is as wide as ever do you think that we that it might fall victim of basically uh rich fatigue you know of, of you know basically too much there's you know i mean there's one thing about it's one thing when there's a, a little bit of aspirational tv you know dynasty back in the 80s and what have you and actually the dynasty reboot you know disclosure friend of mine is a writer on the show but it is a good show it's a lot of fun um mm -hmm. you could say that you you know people might get fatigued of watching rich people with you know rich people problems <laughs> yeah but i think the show is a little bit 
from from the promos I've seen, I think the show is a little bit more than that, right? I mean, I think people who are in a long-standing family business, mm. you know, small or big, will be able to re relate to this. You know, their father has run the business, you know, his whole life. You're one of many siblings. You know, who's going to get to run the business? I think I think it's people will relate to it on that end too. But but I, I see your point. I think that's more applicable to like billions. You know, <laughs> the types of <laughs> the types of problems that the characters in billions have. But, but I don't know. We'll see with this show. Yeah, but but we'll, what it will really come down to, and uh, once again, I'm biased because I'm a writer, but what it will really come down to is the writing. If the writing is yeah. strong, it, it will carry the show because the thing that Billions has going for it, over, above and, ab and beyond anything, is the writing. I recently re I recently read the pilot to Billions, um, just you know, doing some research for a project I'm working on, and my God, that dialogue jumps off the page. And every script, especially this this third season, has just been phenomenal. So if the writing's good, I think this this thing's got legs. And Adam yeah. Adam McKay, I mean, he did such a great job with the Big Short, a book I read in the in the depths and the dearth of the recession, trying to figure out why I lost my house, lost my car, moved back in with my mom as a 35 year old man. <laughs> and I was just, I thought that movie was, I thought that book was unfilmable. And somehow mm -hmm. that is a great movie. So I, I really do trust the creators behind this. And like you, I can't wait. I've been checking like, you know, nefarious streaming services and also, you know, oh, HBO gosh. in general, also HBO in general to see if they'll release it early. They have not early? released it early, damn it. Release yeah. the tapes. At least tapes. Yeah. Sometimes they do do that. That's good of you to check. I, I forgot. I, I should do that too. Yeah, Keep no, checking. We, we, we just got to wait. We just got to wait a few more hours. Well, Courtney, mm -hmm. I have to get up way too much of your time. We always have such a good time. Please come back. You're always such a great guest. Of course. Thank yes. you for having me. Thank yes. You. Yes, Courtney. So thanks everybody for hanging with us, going over our five things, seeing what we find interesting in culture and being true to those crypto and fiat streets. Courtney, plug your ish. Is it just the joke coins? Anything else you're working on? Mm, a bunch of other random stuff that is not related to cryptocurrency. Um, I'm working on a story about the sharing economy and businesses who kind of are building their business models on top of companies like Uber, if that makes any sense. Um, mm -hmm. It's really in the early stages. So that's it. Oh, that sounds <laughs> interesting. I mean, and, and that's another, yeah. to borrow the startup term, disruptive uh, business model, which will which has been changing the way we you know do stuff. So that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I look forward to seeing that. And awesome. uh, and once again, real quick shill, Charlotte, I'm going to be in you three days from now. Let's do this. Black Enterprise Entrepreneur Summit, June 6th through 9th, Charlotte, North Carolina. My panel is June 7th, 1215 to 115. Hopefully there'll be some streaming or something so we can refer to it later. Hosted by the lovely Samara Lynn, who will be our guest tomorrow on the Blacks and Bitcoin podcast. Doing a She's awesome. Show. That's great. Yeah, we're doing a mutual show. Yeah. So look forward to that. So thanks, everybody, for listening, for watching. Courtney Brown, CNBC, Squawk Box, Courtney Brown, Columbia University of Journalism graduate, Courtney Brown. Thanks. We look forward to seeing you again. And everybody, if you love Bitcoin, hodl if you hear me. <laughs>